drove through or flew over the New Mexico desert, the Arizona desert. If you took away the atmosphere, you thought you were looking at Mars. And you know, it wasn't hard to envision ourselves being on Mars someday, or visiting our grandchildren on Mars someday. Uh, we, our Mars program has lately been in the news, not entirely happily. And so we have invited to our, be our opening speaker this morning, Bob Downley. Uh, you have Bob's biography or read biography. It's only a very small segment of it. In your program book, Bob is one of the people who are actually making the future happen. And he will speak this morning on revamping the Mars program. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you, Jerry. I'm beginning this talk with this picture of a Mars sample return mission because under ordinary circumstances I'd be talking about how this was representative of what NASA was going to do in the year 2003. Put a lander on Mars, send a rover out to sample Mars, and send a vehicle back to connect Mars with the Earth. This would be the first beginning of a bridge between Earth and Mars. And to really understand where we are today, it's necessary to talk not just about where we are, but where we've been and where we think we're going to be going. So I'm going to give you a little historical background in preparation for the Mars program in its fluid state today. And in order to even attempt to match the speaking quality of some of the subsequent speakers, I have brought with me a videotape produced by the Sony Corporation that says a little bit about Mars and why it's important to explore. Could we start the videotape, please? Here. 
yes, that's Valles Marineris, a canyon far wider than the Grand Canyon and extending about the length of the continental United States. It virtually curdles the planet. It's helpful to look back on the history of Mars exploration. First of all, I need to put the caveat that America has not been the only Mars explorer. The Soviet Union and Russia have also sent probes to Mars. Uh, their record of success has been extremely checkered. A uh, few have actually made it to the surface, but uh, the one that did only lasted for a few seconds before it stopped transmitting data. We, on the other hand, in the midst of the Cold War with Russia in the 1960s, managed to score success after success with Mars. First, Mariner 4 flew by Mars, showing the surface to be crater. Nobody expected craters. Very old and very dry. And people that had begun to anticipate a wet, Earth-like planet were immediately disappointed. However, subsequent missions, in particular the Mariner 9 orbiter, the first two go into orbit around another planet, began to reveal the more complex nature of Mars and showed that at one time it certainly did have water. And with the Viking orbiters, two orbiters and two landers, we were able to explore Mars in depth. Next slide, please. With Viking in 1976, we actually put down and began to explore Mars up close. We sampled the surface got some idea of the surface chemistry, and began the debate about whether Mars is capable of supporting life. There were some indications that were very, very clear that there is no indication of life there now. One experiment has been interpreted to say maybe perhaps the debate continues, but the important point about Viking is that it was a milestone. This was the culmination of years of work to actually put a lander on Mars and at the end of the day, 1976, once we had a presence on Mars the last three years, there was no follow-up underway. It just sort of sat there, and folks that wanted to continue the exploration pretty much got Viking, and there wasn't anything else going. That began to change in the early 1980s. Next slide, please. When people began to suggest, you know, we ought to find a way to make space missions cheaper, less expensive, more regular, sound familiar, but this was 10 years before faster, better, cheaper. This was the age of the Observer series. These would be a set of spacecraft, modifications of standard Earth orbiters that could be produced on an assembly line and modified either for Mars exploration, lunar exploration, just continue making a series. And in the event that one doesn't work out, no matter, there would be another on the assembly line, just bring that out and continue the process. This began about 1984, and Mars Observer was originally scheduled to launch on a space shuttle, and that was canceled after Challenger. It went through extensive modifications, lingered as a shuttle mission for a while, then was changed to a launch of a Titan, and increasingly it became clear that the Observer series did not have a follow-up, that Mars Observer was going to be a one-of-a-kind mission, no duplication, so more and more effort was put to squeeze as much out of uh, this mission as possible. It carried an amazing assortment of instruments, cameras, magnetometers, sensors for infrared, sensors to measure conditions on the atmosphere. It was it tried to be everything to all Mars scientists. It launched in 1992, and in 1993, a few days before its scheduled encounter with Mars, contact was lost. 
Uh, many studies have been done. Unfortunately, due to the design of the craft, it was necessary to turn off the transmitter at the time it was performing a critical operation. And when nothing was heard, all you had was speculation about what actually happened. Some have pointed the finger at the propulsion system. Others have pointed out any number of things that could have happened that would have <coughs> caused Mars Observer to run silent. But this, the fact that it did, jolted the program enormously. However, that jolt did not last long. Next slide, please. Because even as Mars Observer was being prepared for launch, a mission had been approved called Mars Pathfinder that was taking a somewhat different tack. Tried to build a very robust, reliable lander, in some ways less capable than the Viking lander. For example, it was going to be solar powered so it wouldn't have the lifetime that a plutonium powered vehicle would have. But Pathfinder embodied the early elements of 1990s style, faster, better, cheaper. Further, it would go one step beyond by actually carrying a rover and having it explore around there. This was very daring stuff and was very exciting that even as Mars Observer was being scrutinized, that we were going to be following it up right away with another Mars mission. What remained to be done was to put another orbiter around Mars, and that became Mars Global Surveyor. It was approved shortly after Mars Observer failure. It was designed to be a smaller, more resilient version of Mars Observer, much less expensive, and carry all but two of the science instruments that had been planned for Mars Observer. And I'll say a few more words in the next few graphics. Uh, first of all, uh, is there any prospect that we can get sound on this this VCR? By the absence, I will I will assume that the VCR is out of commission for this. Pathfinder launched in 1996, landed on the 4th of July, 1997, Independence Day. We invaded another world, and for over 80 days was a phenomenal success. The original plan had called for the lander to operate for only a few days, take panoramic pictures of the surface, send the rover out, and for a few days longer explore around, and it lasted far beyond that. More good press came towards NASA for the success of this mission than, than anything since Apollo, and it was a glorifying time to be working at JPL at that time. I, I remember volunteering there and seeing all the press from around the world that were there, and uh, they were ecstatic. And coming so soon after Mars Observer, this was a tremendous time. Next slide, please. Not to be outdone was the successor mission, Mars Global Surveyor. The same project manager that ran Mars Observer was also running Mars Global Surveyor, did a fantastic job of bringing it through. And when it went into orbit around Mars in September of 1997, we knew we were back. Mars was going to be explored intensively, and for the past several years, it has been cataloging thousands and thousands of features on the surface. In fact, just this past week, over 25,000 pictures were released to the general public for examination, and it's going to continue taking data from the surface for years and years to come. Next slide, please. But the thing that's been tantalizing us for all these many years is whether Mars would have supported life ever. Clearly, Pathfinder gave indications of landing in a riverbed as we had expected to see. But, uh, as soon as I saw the first pictures from Mars, I immediately thought of the Arroyo Seco near JPL, which is itself a dry riverbed, and the similarities were startling. I'm sure a few conspiracy theorists have uh, suggested that's where we reenacted this whole scene. I am sure you did not. But we've long known from orbital photographs 
evidence of dry river channels. At one time, the surface of Mars looked very different with the possibility of freestanding water, certainly indications of flowing water. Next slide, please. And then the unexpected happened. In 1996, a meteorite discovered in Antarctica that had gone uh, through a very uh, obscure period. We recognized it as being Martian. We could tell from the chemistry that it almost certainly came from the surface. And on closer examination, they found evidence of what some have called microfossils in the surface. Or rather, I should say, very deep within the rock. Uh, this was highly charged stuff. People have speculated about life on Mars for years. Nobody, nobody imagined that a sample was going to be delivered to us that uh, would give such an indication. But almost immediately, there was a counter argument that no, no, these structures could possibly be explained as natural in origin. They are too small for any viable life form to reproduce. And the debate is still going. But this sent a shock through the system and gave us some powerful impetus to bring back a sample and allow us to explore Mars by careful selection of what we bring back. Not just a random sample, but actually go and say, OK, this came from here. The conditions around it were thus. And therefore, we have some indication uncontaminated by any possible Earth material. Next slide, please. So a Mars program was developed that was aimed at the common thread of water. We would use this to explore for evidence of life, but it would also give us indication of current and past climate and what resources might be there for eventual utilization by follow-up missions not just unmanned, but possibly manned exploration. And so the character of the Mars program built from that. Next slide, please. The feature I want to draw your attention to is a careful stair step. Every two years, Mars is in an optimal position for sending payloads between Earth and the planet. And NASA pledged that they would continue a series of missions that would lead up to a Mars sample return. We would do this first with Mars Pathfinder, demonstrating the uh, safe landing on Mars, Mars Global Surveyor, mapping the surface intensively to look for credible landing sites, Mars Polar Lander, which would land near the Martian South Pole and give us some idea of the terrain there, give some indications. Uh, not shown here, this is an old view rep, Mars Climate Orbiter, which would carry one of the instruments that Mars Observer carried that Mars Global Surveyor did not premiere, would study the atmosphere. Mars O1 Orbiter would carry the gamma ray spectrometer as its prime instrument, giving mineral indications of the surface. And a Mars O1 Lander, sort of a test bed for future landers that would send out rovers on the surface and eventually bring them back. A clear pattern leading up to an objective that was very, very well received throughout the scientific community. Next slide, please. And Mars sample return would not just be an American mission, but it would be a joint project with the French as well. Because in order to bring the payload back, the French would provide a, a vehicle that would pick up samples that were delivered to Martian orbit by the American craft. And the French would have the opportunity to uh, share in the exploration of another planet. Next slide, please. The way this would have worked, and I Please remember, I'm speaking now past tense. The way it would have worked is a launch in 2003 to put a lander on Mars 
with a Mars Ascent vehicle and a rover. The lander and the rover would each collect samples, bring it back to the Mars Ascent vehicle, and launch it into orbit around the planet for eventual pickup. Next slide, please. The rover would be far more capable than the original Pathfinder. Pathfinder could only range less than 100 yards. Athena, the new mission, would be able to average up to 100 yards a day and continue operating for 90 days as opposed to the few days that had originally been planned for the Sojourner rover and Pathfinder. It would help collect samples from remote sites and eventually bring them back for transport back to Mars. I want you to remember this view. It will come up again later. Next slide. And this is an artist illustration by uh, Pat Rawlings, who I'm sure you'll be seeing after the conference, showing the Mars Ascent vehicle taking off, carrying about half a kilo of material, and the Athena rover wisely getting behind a rock to protect itself against blast, but hopefully sending some pictures back of the MAV ascending. Rather reminiscent to me of the lunar missions where the Apollo astronauts took off in their lab and they had programmed the lunar rover to take pictures on the way up. Next slide, please. <coughs> The 2003 mission was to be followed up by a similar mission in 2005. It also would land on Mars, send samples up into Martian orbit. And then the orbiter, prepared with the cooperation of Kness, would go into Martian orbit. Would the parent or parents of Sylvan Hancock be considered to Then the orbiter built by Pines would scoop up the samples for return to Earth and bring them back. Next slide, please. In addition to being a sample return vehicle, it would also be a vehicle for carrying their own payloads to the surface. These would be the net landers, create a matrix of sites on Mars where they would inspect the surface. And these in turn would make this truly a joint mission and Europeans would enjoy the joy of Mars exploration as with the Americans. Next slide, please. What is the NetLander? Uh, NetLander is a series of landing type missions that would, uh, that would basically do Pathfinder-like sites on Mars to observe the surface and uh, one of them, equal to, would actually uh, probe the surface. A network. Yes. The craft would also provide a telecommunications link to the point on the surface. And as illustrated here, this would help to bring, bring Mars home to the Earth. And this would happen on the time period around 2008 which now that we've actually crossed in the 2000 period, actually begins to feel near again. So, uh, next slide, please. Now this brings us up to the Mars 98 missions. A question, do we, do we have an operating VCR now? We believe? I believe so. Uh, yes, there's another tape that I think would be very timely now. Uh, we have team number two inserted. How you doing? Mars 98 missions were designed to increase our understanding of Mars and would explore the climate of Mars climate's watchable order using the instrument near, which was to measure the composition of the atmosphere and observe what climate patterns there would be. It was to go into orbit in September of 1999, followed by a lander which was to land at the pole in December, carrying with it two microprobes called Deep Space 2. These would be hard landing sending a probe into the surface. And if we have an operating videotape, Mars Climate Orbiter launched six 
successfully. And I want to draw your attention to an interesting feature of the vehicle. Notice on the side is this extremely large solar panel. Uh, this configuration gave it a slight asymmetry. Now, in order to control the attitude of the spacecraft, in order to point the antenna back at the Earth, they used reaction wheels, giant, basically big gyroscopes, that would compensate for the pressure that the sun puts on the panel, and the reaction wheels would spin up a little to try to bring it back. And this allowed you to point the vehicle extremely accurately. It's been a method used for years in Earth workers. There's nothing new or exotic here. But a consequence of using reaction wheels is that eventually one or more of the wheels spins up to a point that can be harmful to the device. You need to actually slow it down, which means you need momentum, you need angular momentum. So periodically, you would reverse the rotation, slow down one of the wheels, and fire thrusters to kind of back you up, keep the spacecraft from spinning. The momentum would be dumped, and then you can continue on. Due to the design of the spacecraft with this large solar panel, uh, this had to be done every couple of days. Again, nothing terribly extraordinary or exotic. But what this meant was that the people on the ground had to be made aware of how the thrusters were firing so that they could compute the trajectory that would be, that would be created. When you are looking at a spacecraft sending a radio signal to the Earth, you get excellent, excellent information from Doppler data of exactly how far it is and how far it is going in the direction you can see. You don't get tremendous data when some momentum is applied perpendicular to that path. So you rely on your ability to model what the spacecraft is doing to help you. In other missions, you might take some photographs, compare your position of a body like Mars against the sky, and that would give you some additional information. But it was calculated that using just the Doppler data and the onboard modeling of what the thrusters are doing, you could aim the Mars climate rover accurately enough. Unseen, unrecognized, was that there was a flaw in the system. As I'm sure you've all heard, the contractor was accustomed to working in English units, and JPL traditionally has been working in metric. So when the information about how much thrust was being applied to the engine was given, the information was being given to us in pounds, and we interpreted it as kilograms, or rather, rather excuse me, as units. And when that happened, it caused us to underestimate by a factor of four the amount of acceleration that was going along the perpendicular to the direction we could see. And so as we got to Mars, we were in fact on a impacting trajectory with the atmosphere, and it was not clearly recognized. And so in September, as we waited, as the, rock, the rockets fired, put it into orbit, waited for its reappearance, it did not appear, and reconstructed the data afterwards, we were able to recognize exactly what had happened. A number of review boards were formed and recognized flaws in the system. A common theme throughout all this is that we were trying to do with the cost of one mission, Mars Pathfinder, two missions, an orbiter and a lander, and that in the process, we had perhaps cut too many corners, pressed people too hard, and stupid mistakes were able to happen. There were clearly ways that this could have been caught with more reviews, but in the press of time, it did not happen. So, so much more attention was given to Mars for lander. Are we going to try one more time here? Yeah. 
Say we can put spacecraft on Mars, but <laughs> is it dead yet? Trying channel three. Oh yes. While you paused here for a second, can you explain how it was that, that this uh, problem between metric and English unit? Did crop up earlier in, in mid-course correction uh, terms. Uh, the question was, uh, how how was this problem not detected in the mid-course corrections? And uh, the answer is, the problem was there. We just did not recognize it. There were there were some difficulties sensing errors that were cropping up perpendicular to the direction that we can see, and that's where the thrusters were doing their corrections. So, by all indications, we were on the right track, but there were some, there were some tantalizing clues that in hindsight, we should have jumped on right away. It just wasn't as apparent. Can you put the sound down, please? Yes. It wasn't apparent at the time just how serious these problems are. There is a tendency in uh, navigation to uh, listen to navigators say, oh my god, we've got to make this correction, otherwise we're going to be many, many miles off, and then when you actually look at the results, well, we're maybe a few millimeters off, we tend to be a very conservative group. So, it was not understood by all what, how significant those indications were. So, it wasn't until we actually got to the planet that it, it jumped out of our face and said, this was a problem. Getting back to Mars Polar Lander, when the mission was under construction, there was some discussion about providing a beacon, the way Pathfinder did, that as it entered through the atmosphere would tell us, okay, I have deployed the chutes, I have begun the retro firings, I have released this device. Mars Polar Lander was being done with less than half the money. It was not using an airbag design, but was using a more traditional landing des landed design because Mars Pathfinder, we recognized, could not be made very much larger. Airbags only worked for payloads up to a certain size. We were right at that limit. So if we were going to test out landing on Mars for future Mars sample return missions, which would necessarily be quite a bit heavier, uh, we needed to practice doing things quote, the more traditional way. This was not anything exotic. And the landing area we were going to was considered fairly benign. So the decision was made, given X amount of dollars, I could put that money into better engineering of the landing system to improve the probability that it will land successfully, or I could put that money into a beacon that would tell me how well things were going, even if the information it sends back is not going so well. And so the decision was made, let's, let's work to increase the probability of a successful landing. Project-wise, that was probably a good allocation of resources. 
what was not appreciated at the time was program-wise, if something went wrong, how would you tell subsequent missions what to do to fix it? And so when we did not hear from Mars Polar Lander after it was released, we were in exactly that predicament. For several months, more study teams were formed, writing report after report after report after report, all of which JPL had to respond to. Uh, crews came by, examined every step that was taken, and for several months, all we had were preliminary estimates that it could be. A number of highly improbable events that could have happened that nobody could prove it wasn't similar to where we were with Mars Observer. And it wasn't until early spring that somebody did a test that replicated what probably happened. There were some sensors on the vehicle that are feeling for any, any vibrations, any jolt. And that's an indication to it that, hey, I made contact with the surface. You can stop firing thrusters now. Well, when Mars Polar Lander opens up its legs, there is a jolt that goes through the spacecraft. And the sensors dutifully say, hey, I felt something. And the software interpreted that as, hey, I'm already on Mars. Stop firing the thrusters. Except at this point, the thrusters had not even started firing yet. The intent was clearly ignore this first jolt. It's the next one that's important. But that was not caught in the software. And so the most likely scenario is that Mars Polar Lander, when it was released from its parachute and allowed to descend, when the rockets were supposed to fire and provide a gentle descent, was already inhibited from firing the rockets and just landed on the surface with a dull thud and probably damaged it to the point where we were not able to communicate. Compounding the mystery was that the two Deep Space Two probes, the ones that were designed for hard landing, also were not heard from. They were supposed to send a signal to Mars to the surveyor passing overhead. Mars to the surveyor listened and listened. No signal was to be found. The tendency was to connect the two, saying, hey, it must be a common problem. The discovery of the software error pretty much dismissed that. And now we, we have a better idea of what could have happened, but again, the cause can never be determined for sure. By way of background, and the video would show this, Deep Space Two was intended to be right at the leading edge of technology, done with a small, tough team it was going to build these two microprobes to penetrate the surface with a fraction of the budget, even of Mars Polar Lander. It was intended to really accept risks to demonstrate that this new technology could work, that we could deploy some of these uh, landers, hard landers, at uh, other mission opportunities, and except that it was probably high risk. Well, when we didn't hear from it, there was a big examination, and lo and behold, the uh, risks were taken that would not have been taken with a larger, more expensive spacecraft that in hindsight probably were unacceptable for this mission. Specifically, the unit was never tested as a whole to verify that it could sustain the accelerations. It was under a very compressed development schedule, and parts came in, we tested them individually. And there were a few parts that were not actually tested in their flight configuration. We tested parts like it. They survived the jolt, put them together. It should be OK. We accepted those risks. And now that they didn't work, we can go back and say, maybe that was not the right thing to do. 
remember the business we are in. We are out to push the boundaries. We have gotten the call to reach farther, <coughs> take chances, and when we find out something doesn't work, we reconsider. And that's exactly where the Mars program has been throughout the year 2000. We have been absorbing all the reports, responding to them. <coughs> I am on the review board that takes this and translates it into lessons learned so that future missions can say, do this, don't do that, and try to rebuild Mars program from there. Next slide, please. Okay, I, I, if you uh, go one or two slides farther, this is this is where the video would have come in. And one after that. So the next order of business was Mars 01. This was the next opportunity. Hardware has already been built. One of them would be an orbiter carrying an instrument to measure the mineralogical content of the surface, still a very valuable mission. The other would put a lander on Mars, along with a rover, very similar to Sojourner on Pathfinder. And this was considered to be a bridge in preparation for a Mars sample return mission. Well, one of the things that was evident after all these reviews were written were that we did not have as much confidence in landing on Mars as we really should have. The landers are sensitive to the surface they land on. A large rock in the wrong spot would cause them to tip over and fail. A large slope greater than even 10 degrees would be sufficient for a Mars polar lander to have gotten into trouble. In this environment, Landing, the design chosen for Mars 01 was considered to be an excessive risk. And so it was decided that at least in 01, this lander would not go, it would just be the Mars 01 orbiter. Now, if we were to do something different for Mars 03, we needed to act quickly because three years with procuring parts and, and negotiating contracts and just generally getting the hardware ready is a short amount of time we need it. We need to make a decision quickly on what we will launch in 03. And the one thing that became very clear is that until we get our feedback, putting a sample return mission in 03 was a goal that our sponsors, taxpayers, were not willing to accept. Don't, we cannot afford to lose missions the way we did in 1999. Continue the Mars program continue to explore, but do it a little more conservatively. Next slide, please. So something needed to fill that opportunity in 03. One of the early proposals was for a, a more advanced orbiter to continue sampling, this, uh, to continue exploring the surface of Mars, perhaps with a more powerful camera to give us a better idea of the terrain. Bear in mind that the best cameras we put in orbit around Mars now have been able to see objects on the order of a few meters. The objects that could be harmful to a lander are an order of magnitude less than that. So if we could begin to fill the gap and get some idea of whether it is truly a flat area or an extremely rocky one, this orbiter would be very valuable. It would also serve as a communications link for future orbiters to go around, rather for future landers that land on the surface so that we can maintain the link. There is an extreme desire to always include a beacon, a link, I should say, on every orbiter that goes to Mars, and this would continue that, give us an added network that would be continued from the O-1 orbiter that would have gotten there a few years earlier. Next slide, please. 
So we held a review back in May for our NASA headquarters to go through the options, and the Mars orbiter was chief amongst them. Out in the wings came a second proposal, not thoroughly examined yet, but a tantalizing possibility that says, all right, we have demonstrated landing capability with a Mars Pathfinder shell. It just so happens that with a lot of manipulation, you might be able to put the Athena rover that you had intended for a Mars sample return mission inside and not much else. This proposal has been dubbed a rover in a bag because almost everything, all the smarts, all the operating controls would be done from a rover and around it would just be a landing system. On Mars Pathfinder, you had a central base that landed, took panchromatic pictures all around, and provided a transport for the rover, which went off to its own thing. The Athena rover, next slide please, would do everything. It would just land on the surface, look around, and begin to roam, and it would have sole length to the surface. Now this is a little more complicated than before because in the past you had Sojourner talking over a period of tens of meters back to the lander, which we could then communicate with, with the Earth directly. Here, the rover would have to provide communication either to the Earth or to the Mars 01 orbiter when it does pass overhead, but much of the time it may not. And so the entire link would be this little rover bouncing over the surface, and every time we'll have to communicate with the Earth. This idea was presented in May, and we were given direction, please look at it some more, and tell us in July if you think that it can be ready for an O3 launch. And that's what's going on right now. Our best people are doing extensive trade study, trying to look for all the problems now and to address them and give a status report in July. And if that report is favorable, this will probably be the mission to go in 03. And we still have the ordinary case. We see some obstacles that are hard to overcome. Next slide, please. And this shows what the rover would look like. This is an extremely early conceptual picture, just cutting and pasting some designs. I apologized to the project manager for the study and said, you know, I would really, really, really like to show this. Uh, I promise I will take this view graph and burn it after and afterwards so that people understand that this is just a cut and paste job. Do not assume that this is representative. And then this week I looked at my aviation week, which has this picture in it. So dis dis disregard those disclaimers. Except that, yes, this is still very preliminary. Please don't assume that it's going to look quite like that. But conceptually, you can see Mars Pathfinder pedals, large rover inside, capability to communicate with the Earth and explore the surface. Next slide, please. In order to work beyond 2003, NASA has put out the call. We are in we are instituting a request for information to all aerospace contractors saying, give us your ideas, let us know what we could or should be doing in the next 20 years. In addition, a workshop is being held in Houston in late July. It's being convened directly from NASA headquarters and the call is out to scientists, engineers, private individuals. If you have a proposal, if you see a place for a specific mission, a specific goal, come see us. The source for information on the site is listed below. If some of you here have that here, I encourage you to look it up and respond. 
Uh, I checked the website just a few days ago. It's still under construction, so you may still see some question marks along with the graphics, but it will go out in coming weeks. NASA is set on returning to Mars because Mars has been a beacon for thousands of years, and someday human footprints will appear on Mars. Next slide. And I'd like to think that in some small way, I may have helped towards making this possible. And if you want to follow and track what develops in the expanding Mars program, I've included a list of websites. They're also available on handouts near the door. I do not want to carry all those lithographs back, so please help me out. And in the minutes I have left, I'll be happy to take questions. Way back there. Yeah, you mentioned that the rover would have a, a, re, a capability to contact the Earth directly. I thought I, I saw it somewhere that it would only be able to communicate through a, a relay set. Is that the case? or? Uh, the question was, would the Mars lander for O3 only be able to communicate with an orbiting satellite would be able to contact directly with the Earth? That is because the design is still very much in flux. There are certainly some very desirable features to be able to contact directly to the Earth, even if a semaphore that I'm okay in case there's any problem with the orbiter, but primarily the orbiter will be our best link because it can it can quote be closer and be a bent pipe for information. Next question. The um, sample return concept uh, throws up a couple of apps in our orbit and relies on another system to bring back. Uh, uh, that is obviously a more uh, cost approach if you don't have to control uh, Earth return system on the surface of Mars, but it also finds rather high risk. There's a lot of debate going on in that approach. Uh, the question was is there a lot of debate about having a Mars sample return system that requires another orbiter to scoop up the samples. Yes, there is. There was, uh, there was a debate before, and that's intensified now. It has several features that are desirable, just like sending Apollo astronauts to the moon. This minimized the size of the vehicle that you have to launch from the surface, and that has repercussions all the way down to the size of the launch vehicle you use to get it back. It still looks like the best system in terms of resources required, but people are working hard to see if they can find ways to reduce the risks of being able to find and retrieve them. And uh, I've taken part in a few of those studies. There, there's still a lot of work to be done, but almost certainly uh, that is going to be looked at very hard in the months ahead. By the end of the year, I failed to mention, we should have the program laid out for at least the next 10 years. Over here. Uh, the question was, uh, what is the status of the Mars airplane Kitty Hawk? Perhaps a little history would be in order. A uh, proposal had gone out a couple of years ago to place into the Martian atmosphere a vehicle that would be able to fly around and take low altitude observations of the surface that would have tremendous advantages over an orbiting system because you get much closer, get much more detail, and to some extent control where you were going. Uh, that had that had originally gone out to uh, NASA Center, I believe Ames was responsible, and the costs began to escalate and it was put aside. It is Last I heard was being considered again for the discovery process this year. I have not heard uh, what its standing is. I can say that in terms of putting aerial devices around Mars, there are some factions that regard balloons as a more efficient system because they have longer hang time and are mechanically simpler. So I would say that a Mars airplane is probably going to be discussed in the coming months as a future mission, but right now there's no definite plans. Up in front.
Uh, the question was uh, if we can choose to map more extensively now versus taking uh, a few uh, landing sites right away, why are we favoring one or the other? Uh, the scientific community has been very involved in the discussion with whether O3 should be a lander versus a, a mapper. It is not clear that we can get a mapping system in place that would have the same accuracy as, say, Iconos now has in, in Earth orbit. Because you're dealing with putting a relatively large spacecraft in orbit around Mars, you have to get it there, and it has to deal with lower light levels. Ideally, it would be great to have a keyhole-type satellite the size of Hubble in orbit around Mars, but it isn't clear if we can, how readily we can do that in the near term. Again, always dealing with limited budgets, can we get a little now and take incremental steps versus taking big steps later? So I don't know if that quite answers the question, but that, that's the, that is the nature of the discussion right now. Uh, that, that, that's a short answer, and uh, I have not seen any proposal that could give us the resolution of the order of a few centimeters any time in the near future. Back here. Uh, I have a question concerning what kind of lessons can you draw at the management level. Uh, obviously, as you were saying, it's now conventionalism we've been doing, trying to get too cheap or too much uh, for too little money. But from what I understand, the pressure that you might imagine is not so much from Congress and the administration, but rather within NASA. What kind of lessons uh, have been developed in work? And a certain level of physicists. Uh, the question was, what management lessons have we learned? I am on the board that is, going, that is analyzing the data to say what what lessons we need to take from all these board reports. Uh, the board reports haven't discussed at a very high level what uh, NASA headquarters should or should not have been doing, but a message that I, I extract, this is my own personal interpretation, is that project managers have to be willing to say no, that is, that is not acceptable, whereas the tendency has been to try very, 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 very hard to please the customer. And I'm afraid here I have to wrap up.